We all love movies, so let me tell you about the 50 I love the most. A lot of the films in this list are interchangeable with the others a few places above or below them, it just depends on how I feel that day. Also, keep in mind I've only been properly interested in movies for like a year and a half, so there's still a lot I haven't seen. Okay, let's go. Okay, so train spotting is just a lot of fun. I really enjoy watching these characters ruining their lives, and I think the sheer, like, disgustingness of a lot of the scenes in here really helps with that. I never thought I'd enjoy watching Ewan McGregor dive into a shitty toilet, but here we are. I first heard about the platform from Pyrocynical's long video essay on it. I got about 15 minutes into that video before stopping it because I knew I had to watch it for myself before listening to any spoilers and oh my god it is incredible. I'm not going to be able to do it justice in a shorter format as this, so if you want a really in-depth look at the film, go watch that Pyrocynical video. After you finish this one of course. Basically, I find the themes really intriguing. The concept of this film is brilliant and all the performances were so engaging. Go watch this movie. So many people have talked about this movie already, but I still want to give my thoughts. Obviously, I loved it, it's in my top 50, but I just found the story interesting in a way that not many other films have achieved. I think this was partly due to the fantastic acting from everyone involved, although I have to admit I did spend half the film trying to figure out if I was watching Jesse Eisenberg or Michael Cera. I swear, Jesse Eisenberg is to Michael Cera what Mewtwo is to Mew. Now, Little Miss Sunshine is the first movie on this list that falls into one of my favourite subgenres of film. I don't quite know what to call it, but it basically consists of studio-backed films that feel like indie films about dysfunctional characters learning to cope with each other. It's very niche, I know, but I feel like it creates some of the most heartfelt stories in the entire medium. I know it's been reposted into oblivion, but the you can't fly jets if you're colorblind scene is so heartbreaking every time you watch the film. Also, the scene at the end where the whole family dances together is great. I know this is also a bit niche, but I love dancing scenes that don't feel choreographed, but instead just feel like the actors were told to go for it and are just having fun in front of the camera. I don't know, something about it just makes me happy. Juno also falls into that subgenre I just spoke about, and I think it works even better here. Elliot Page and Michael Cera are so lovable, and that makes parts of this film so heartbreaking to watch. When I first watched this film, it actually made me not want to watch any other movie for a few days because I knew nothing would feel like this one did. A lot of people compare Triangle of Sadness to Don't Look Up, but I swear the differences between them are like the difference between H&M and Balenciaga. I can't believe I just made that joke. I thought that most of this movie was really smart, and parts of it were absolutely hilarious. I'm proud to admit that one of my best ever cinema experiences was retching and cackling with an entire room of strangers at a group of rich people projectile vomiting and shitting for multiple minutes. My Neighbor Totoro is just so comfortable to watch. I know that I can put this film on and feel relaxed whilst having a good time. Like most Studio Ghibli movies, Totoro has that warm feeling that makes it so enjoyable. Ghibli video coming soon. Maybe. This is the most recent addition to my list. I watched it because I saw it got added to Netflix and thought it looked fun. I didn't expect to love human traffic as much as I did, but now I'm so glad I watched it. This is basically a more fun train spotting that's set in Wales instead of Scotland. Any movie where I get to listen to Danny Dyer ramble about drug culture representation in Star Wars is an instant hit. I love the sense of humour in every Monty Python project that I've seen, and Holy Grail is definitely one of the best examples of it. I don't think there's an unfunny joke in this film. There's not really a lot to say about most comedies other than they're funny, so I'll leave it there. The Perks of Being a Wallflower falls into that same comfy subgenre from earlier. I adore watching these characters interact with each other, even when things go wrong. Logan Lerman was heartfelt in his performance, Emma Watson was brilliant, and I know that Ezra Miller has since turned into the real-life Joseph Seed, but I really liked them here. This movie walks the line between comforting and heartbreaking for very obvious reasons. If you haven't seen it, I won't spoil anything, but I just want to clarify I'm not saying that that part of the film is comforting. Ferris Bueller is who I wish I was, and I think that everyone feels the same way when they watch this movie. This film is just so fun and relaxing, and it just makes you feel good when you watch it. It's funny, the relationships are believable and engaging, and the carnival scene alone puts it in this list. This is a big change from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but I think The Lighthouse is brilliant in a horrific and terrifying kind of way. Yeah, I was laughing when Robert Pattinson said he wanted to fuck a steak. Yeah, it was funny when Willem Dafoe roleplayed the dog for Batman. But the atmosphere in this movie creates a sense of fear unlike anything else I've ever seen. Watching these two men devolve into insanity evokes some sense of sheer terror within us, and it is phenomenal. 
Memento is my favourite Christopher Nolan film. I just think it's fantastic. Guy Pearce delivers an absolutely stellar performance as Leonard, which just really elevates this film to another level. I think the concept and plot are endlessly fascinating, but I can't talk about it too much without spoiling it. It's a really great movie that you should definitely go watch if you haven't already. Porco Rosso might be the nicest looking Studio Ghibli film. The beautiful airships, the gorgeous painted clouds and the stunning water create so many scenes I could stare at for hours. Visually, this movie is incredible, but of course, that's not where all its merit is. The narrative of Porco Rosso is inspiring. Born out of fear of fascism and oppression, this story is, in my opinion, Hayao Miyazaki's most devastating, at least out of the ones I've seen. A lot of people overlook this movie because, at a first glance, it's just about a pig flying a plane, but this film is so much more than that. It's a look at grief, the morality of war, the sanctity of personal autonomy, and how it's better to be a pig than a fascist. Speaking of devastating movies, A Ghost Story is a heartbreaking look at love and loss. I already made an entire video dedicated to just this film, so I won't talk about it too much here, but just know that it's phenomenal. Bit of a change of pace here, but Scott Pilgrim vs The World is charming and lovable in so many ways. I think the little details really make this film. I really appreciate things like the fact that no one blinks on camera to make it feel more like a video game. I also think the new anime adaptation of the film slash graphic novels looks really cool. I really think that Your Name is a beautiful film. The story is really sweet and heartwarming, the animation and art style are gorgeous and the music slaps. I haven't seen Suzume yet, but I've heard people say it's even better than this, so I'm excited for whenever I finally get around to watching it. How could I make a list of my favourite films without including Austin Powers? Mike Myers delivers, in my opinion, his best performance here, creating one of my favourite comedies of all time. Like with other comedy movies, there's not really a way to explain why I like this other than saying it's funny. I watched 2001 A Space Odyssey at a special screening at my favourite cinema, and it was magnificent. I didn't really know much about the film before I went in, just the really obvious details, but I was totally blown away by it. The fact that Kubrick managed to achieve these visuals in 1968 is just incredible. I don't totally understand the ending, but I think the score, cinematography, character writing and acting were all just on another level from most other movies. Ooh, our first Tarantino film. I kind of flip between whether I prefer Inglorious Bastards or Django Unchained, but right now I think I like Django a little more. This film grips you right from the opening scene, where Christoph Waltz delivers one of the most stunning, bone-chilling monologues I've ever watched. I really do love everything about this film, from Brad Pitt's introduction of the Bastards to Melanie Laurent's cinema plot. It's all just spectacular. I'm a really big Indiana Jones fan, and like most, I think Raiders of the Lost Ark is the best indie movie. I do also love the next two movies, and we will pretend the two after those don't exist, but I do think Indiana Jones is at its best in Raiders. I think the set pieces in Raiders, like the Golden Idol or the Boulder, are just stellar and create some brilliant action. Harrison Ford is consistently wonderful in every indie movie, not just this one, but it's still my favourite. Django Unchained was actually my first Tarantino film. Jamie Foxx was even better than usual, which is difficult to achieve because I think he's a fantastic actor. Recently, I really loved him in They Clone Tyrone, but let's stick to Django. There are so many memorable scenes here. Django's entrance in his blue suit, the I like the way you die boy fight, the massive gunfight at the end, the I count two guns exchange, oh my god, I could go on forever. Django Unchained is phenomenal, and it was a fantastic introduction to Tarantino. I absolutely adore the whole feel of The Truman Show. The gradual building of empathy towards Truman, the creeping paranoia that surrounds his life, it's just incredible. I feel like I'm saying very similar things for every film, but they're my favourites. I'm not going to start slagging them off or giving constructive criticism. Anyway, this is, in my opinion, Jim Carrey's best performance in his most interesting role. He really puts a lot into the character, and does so much that elevates the film to the next level. Up is one of those films that I loved as a kid, and so that love carries over to how I feel about the film now. This movie is both heartwarming and heartbreaking, and I think the married life sequence is one of the best pieces of filmmaking I've ever seen. It's just fantastic. I won't talk much about Life of Brian because I mainly love it for the same reasons as Holy Grail, I just think this one is funnier. Super I spoke a lot about Barbie in my Barbenheimer video, but I still want to dedicate some time to it here. This movie is so smart, so funny and so important. Its message needs to be understood by everyone, 
Also, if you're one of those Ben Shapiro idiots that thinks Barbie is anti-men, it's really not. It spends part of the movie treating men how women are treated in both media and the real world, so if you didn't like how it felt, this doesn't even happen for the whole movie. Part of the plot is about Ken being enough, without having to try to impress Barbie. Oh my god, I've just spent the entire Barbie segment talking about men. I love every actor's performance, especially Margot Robbie, she's just incredible in everything, but especially here. I think this is her best role. The set designs were stunning, and the plot is just fantastic. I really do love everything about this film. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is one of the most fun movies I've ever watched. Normally, I'm not the biggest musical fan, but this and Little Shop of Horrors are definitely exceptions. This film is so funny, the acting is exactly what it needs to be, and the sets and costumes are amazing. Where the Wild Things Are is a really important film to me. Although the other people I watched it with didn't really like it, it means a lot to me. This film is a representation of mental health and neurodivergence in a unique way. Whilst it's never explicitly stated, Max is quite clearly autistic, at least in my opinion, and the wild things are figments of his imagination that help him cope with the stresses of daily life, with each of them representing different aspects of his personality. Autistic representation is so hard to come by in media, and as an autistic person, seeing a film that represents your neurodivergence in a way that hits so close to home is really special. I made a whole video about the misrepresentation of autism in TV and film if you're interested. Shin Godzilla is such an interesting movie to me. I think a lot of people misunderstand Godzilla, mainly because of the portrayal of the kaiju in American movies. What a lot of these movies fail to understand is that Godzilla isn't meant to be an action movie about a big monster destroying a city. It's a metaphor for the horrors of the nuclear bombs that were dropped on Japan at the end of World War II. To me, Shin Godzilla is a perfect representation of those horrors. Godzilla's constantly evolving form represents the constant development of new weaponry and the subsequent increase in fear across the world. When you watch American Godzilla movies, you get a kick out of watching him tear down skyscrapers or fighting King Kong. But in Shin Godzilla, you're terrified when he first uses his atomic breath. It's a fantastic scene from a fantastic film, and the Evangelion music elevates it even higher. Okay, I know Joker's been turned into a We Live in a Society character, but I still think this film is incredible. Joaquin Phoenix delivers one of the most jaw-dropping performances I've seen in any film, ever. He's a truly fantastic actor, and I'm excited to see him in Napoleon. The writing, cinematography and soundtrack of this film culminate in a chilling experience that I could rewatch endlessly. Big Hero 6, like Up, is a movie I loved as a kid, so of course I'm still going to love it now. I rewatched it a couple of months ago, and whilst it wasn't quite as good as I remember, I still have a lot of love for it. Rushmore is a really special movie. Whilst I was watching it for the first time, I didn't really rate it that much, but in the time afterwards I've had to think about it, it's slowly become one of my favourite films. Jason Schwartzman is such a brilliant actor, but I feel like he gets overlooked by a lot of people. He deserves to be in so many more movies. He's excellent, and that excellence is demonstrated brilliantly in Rushmore. Max Fisher has so much charm to him that makes Schwartzman a joy to watch. Spirited Away is the majority of people's favourite Studio Ghibli film, and whilst it's certainly close, it comes second for me. I have nothing bad to say about this movie. The voice acting in both the original Japanese recordings and the English dub are brilliant, although I do prefer watching almost everything in the original language it was written and recorded in. I think the only exceptions to that were all Dragon Ball, Pokemon and Cowboy Bebop. Anyway, Spirited Away is animated beautifully, and there are so many iconic scenes that make it so fun to watch. I know this might shock some people, but Laputa or Cars in the Sky is my favourite Ghibli movie. Yeah, Spirited Away might objectively be better, but I have a lot of love for this film. This was my first Ghibli, so that, combined with when and where I watched it, along with who I watched it with, does make me biased towards it. But this is a list of my favourite films, so it's all biased. Life is Beautiful is a heartbreaking film. For those of you that don't know, this is a holocaust comedy. Stay with me. I, I know that doesn't sound good, but just let me explain. The opening of this film is hilarious. It's set in Italy during the early years of Hitler's time as Führer, and follows a Jewish shop owner called Guido. Obviously, this is an incredibly heavy and serious topic, but the comedy and the protagonist are so light-hearted that it feels as though we are watching a child that's oblivious to the horrors happening around him. Then, in the second half of the film, we actually are watching a child that can't see these horrors. After he and his family are forced into a concentration camp, Guido spends his time trying to convince his young son that this is all a big game that they're playing for his birthday, and comes up with comedic ways to avoid what's actually going on. These scenes are heart-wrenching, but they are presented in a comedic way that juxtaposes the tension, 
somehow doing the impossible and creating a heartbreaking, tear-jerking story that can still make us laugh. This is filmmaking at its finest. If you haven't watched it, please go and do so after this video. Fantastic Mr. Fox is, in my opinion, Wes Anderson's second best movie. The colour palette is stunning, and both the stop motion and cinematography are so fun to watch. Every character on screen feels so full of life, which is credit to both the animators and the actors voicing them. We've gotten into the part of the list where every film is perfect for me, even if they have flaws that I can acknowledge. What is there to say about Star Wars that hasn't been said? Well, a lot apparently, considering I made a 25 minute video about it. Star Wars is my favourite movie franchise, even if I have lost interest recently. This first film feels so magical to me, despite knowing how they achieved each effect. Star Wars was my hyperfixation for like 5 years, so it's safe to say I love it a lot. I know this is a very popular opinion, but I think the Grand Budapest Hotel is Wes Anderson at his best. I think that this film has the perfect amount of both sides of Anderson's movies, heartbreaking stories and gorgeous visuals. Wes Anderson films are about messy people in perfect places, and nowhere is this idea more consistently present than in Grand Budapest. Sure, there are individual scenes in other movies that show heart better than this film does, like the shaving scene in Royal Tenenbaums or the conversation between Jason Schwartzman and Margot Robbie in Asteroid City, but I think that Grand Budapest is the most consistent. I love it. I love The Breakfast Club for very similar reasons to why I love Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I just love this one a lot more. Every character here is so interesting, and I just want to spend every day watching them. I love all of them as characters, even if some of them aren't particularly great people. This movie feels warm and fun, and I think everyone should watch it. Reservoir Dogs was an absolutely insane feature directorial debut for Quentin Tarantino. He absolutely knocked it out of the park. Like most of Tarantino's work, the majority of the entertainment comes from the brilliant dialogue and the unique characters, and there's no shortage of either here. The plot is so gripping that you can't help but cling on to every word. It's fantastic. As much as I love the original Star Wars movie, there's no denying that Empire Strikes Back is better. Irvin Kirshner took everything that was great about A New Hope and took it even further, creating one of the best sequels in movie history. It's Such a Beautiful Day is one of the most devastating films I've ever watched. It left me crying in my chair for a long time. The hand-drawn animation is so simplistically beautiful, and the plot is heartbreaking. For those of you that don't know, this film follows Bill through his life as his brain tumour gets more and more severe. This movie is brilliant, it's clever, and it's tear-jerking. Please go watch it. Twelve Angry Men was recommended to me by a friend in the changing rooms before PE, and I'm so happy he told me about it. As you can probably tell, I absolutely love films that focus on dialogue. I think it's so interesting to watch the dynamic shift between characters based on only the things they're saying. All the big events and revelations within the narrative happen solely because of the ideas and opinions presented by the various characters. There are so many memorable scenes here, Jura 8 retracing the steps of the supposed witness, the reveal of a second knife, Jura 10 making his racist speech as the other jurors turn away from him. It's all incredible, and creates one of the best films I've ever seen. Okay, I know that a lot of the films I've already talked about are better than Revenge of the Sith, but that doesn't change how much I love this movie. This is my favourite Star Wars movie for a whole load of reasons. Firstly, Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor both give their best performances here. Yeah, the dialogue is clunky and unrealistic, but that's the fault of the script, not these actors. Also, I just adore the narrative. Being able to watch Anakin devolve into Vader over the course of this film was amazing. All of the music is fantastic, and the fight scenes are stunning. Revenge of the Sith is so much fun, and I don't understand why some people hate it so much. The Batman is cinema. This is by far the best Batman movie, and the best DC movie. It's even the third best comic book movie. In my opinion at least, but my word is law. Everything about this film is stunning. I love the fact that it focuses on Batman actually solving a crime. He's the world's greatest detective, yet in his movies, he's never actually shown to solve anything. Robert Pattinson exceeded every expectation with his portrayal of the character, and he was supported fantastically by Paul Dano, Zoe Kravitz, Jeffrey Wright, Colin Farrell, Andy Serkis, everyone really. The Batman has the best cinematography I've ever seen. Every shot is beautiful, and the black and red colour palette is stunning. This film does such a good job making Gotham feel like an actual city. Most people say the Nolan trilogy are the best Batman movies, and yeah, they're really good, but Gotham is just Chicago, the Batmobile looks stupid, and Batman sounds ridiculous. I don't have any of these problems with the Batman. As I said, Gotham feels alive. The Batmobile is a muscle car, and its introduction might be the best moment in the film, and I think Pattinson's Batman voice is the best we've had. 
I will admit, this movie isn't quite as easy to rewatch as Nolan's films. Trust me, I watched it four times in six months, but I still love it. Yeah, okay, I know having Pulp Fiction in my top five makes me look like one of the film bros that everyone makes fun of, but come on, I mean it's Pulp Fiction. Everyone knows this movie is spectacular. It's fun, it looks good, the dialogue is engaging, the characters are interesting, and the music slaps, ultimately culminating in a film without a single forgettable scene. You do have to deal with Tarantino's self-insert character being Tarantino's self-insert character, but yeah, there's no defending that. Still, I own the wallet from this movie and Jules' ID, which I think is pretty cool. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. What a movie. This film is truly perfect, and I won't accept any other opinion, until its sequel released Into the Spider-Verse at the best animation I'd ever seen. The art style and differing frame rates create a visual experience unlike anything that had come before it. The plot is heartfelt, the characters are so fun to spend time with, and the voice acting is stellar. Miles is my favourite Spider-Man, and Shamik Moore gives my favourite performance of any Spider-Person ever. A close second is Yuri Lowenthal in the PS4 games. Everything Everywhere All at Once blew my mind when I first watched it, and it continued to do so on every rewatch. There is not a single thing about this film that I don't adore. I spoke about this in my MCU video, but I believe the correct way to create a multiversal story is to have the stakes be personal. In the face of the overwhelming scale of the multiverse, the only thing that can effectively draw us into the story and make us actually care about what happens to these characters is if we connect them emotionally. Everything Everywhere All at Once hinges on this emotional attachment and pulls it off spectacularly. As an audience, we care deeply about what happens to Evelyn, and we are drawn into her relationships as though we are an active part of them. We want her marriage with Wayman to be fixed, we want her maternal relationship with Joy to be repaired, and we want to see her prove herself to her father. This happens not only because of the emotional story, but also the awe-inspiring performances delivered by pretty much everyone in this film. Michelle Yeoh, Stephanie Hsu, Jamie Lee Curtis and Kei Kwan are spectacular for every second they are on screen. It's difficult to make an audience feel emotional about a dance between two people with hot dog fingers, but everything everywhere all at once succeeds at this. Furthermore, no other film can make me cry at a silent scene of two rocks with googly eyes talking to each other using text on the screen, but everything everywhere all at once succeeds at this too. I have nothing but love for this film, and for a long time it was my favourite, but it was recently beaten by our next and final movie. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is my favourite film of all time. I have made an entire video explaining why I love it, but it would be an anticlimactic end to this video if I just told you to go watch that one, although you should still do that after. This movie is the most impressive piece of art I have ever had the absolute pleasure of experiencing. Every aspect of this film highlights the greatest extent of creativity I've ever seen displayed. Every single frame of the movie has a level of beauty that I haven't seen in anything ever. The constantly switching art and animation styles create an experience that is visually overstimulating in just the right way. Every actor here gives performances that knock those from the previous film absolutely out of the park. There's so much emotion in every exchange. This film is action-packed, yet the quieter conversational moments stick with you just as long as any fight or chase sequence. The scene in which Miles and Gwen sit on top of a building and talk to each other about Gwen's past and her place in the universe is jaw-dropping, and so is the sequence in which they swing through the city together. The music in Across the Spider-Verse is also stunning. Both Daniel Pemberton's scores and Metro Booming's soundtrack are perhaps the best I've ever heard. Whatever sacrifices every ancient civilization did finally paid off because there's no way these two would exist without some sort of divine influence. Every bit of music in the score is emotional due to the excellent use of light motifs to make each Spider-Person's theme personal to them. Additionally, every song in the soundtrack slaps. I listen to it as a whole album almost every day. There has not been a day since Across the Spider-Verse's release, which at the time of writing this is almost three months, where I haven't thought about it. I remember doing the final two weeks of my GCSEs after watching it and spending every bit of free time I had in those exams replaying scenes in my brain. There is no way to accurately include everything I adore about this film in this video. I would be here all day. But I just want to say that, to me, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is perfect, and I just hope that I can make something half as good as it within my lifetime. Thank you for watching.